Hello and welcome to PS On Air, where Project Syndicate writers take questions from the newspapers that publish them. I'm Philippe Lecrain, a contributor to Product Syndicate myself, and in the hot seat today is superstar economist Nura Rubini, the founder of Rubini Macro Associates. And joining us today to ask the questions is Melanie Laws, the online editor for the German business magazine Bilanz, and Matthias Ohanian, editorial director of the Swiss business weekly Handled Zeitung. Nuriel, great to have you with us, especially because your vocal cords are under strain, so you're really making an exceptional effort uh, to be here. Uh, it's great being here today. So let's start off uh, with uh, Brexit. British Prime Minister Theresa May uh, has finally notified uh, the EU of her intention, or Britain's intention, uh, to leave. Uh, when uh, do you think uh, that uh, the impact uh, of Brexit uh, on the UK economy is going to be felt, and how severe do you think it'll be? Well, initially, after the Brexit vote, uh, the economy did not slow down because uh, consumer and business confidence were sustained and there was massive monetary, fiscal and credit easing. And the weakness of the pound and lower interest rates helped maintain economic growth. However, there is already some evidence that the UK economy is slowing down now. Uh, inflation is picking up, nominal wages are not rising, real wages are being squeezed, houses are cut back on their savings, but there's a limit how much they can borrow. And the business sector is also becoming somehow more cautious. So what are they saying? Gradual slowdown. In my view, uh, the extent of that slowdown is gonna depend on the state of negotiation. If there are gonna be bad news, there is a clash on the two sides, that's gonna have a negative impact on business and consumer confidence. It's gonna to lead to further slowdown of economy. Uh, secondly, there'll be impacts on financial markets, including a possible correction of stock prices. They might have a negative impact. But over the medium long term, the impact is gonna be that whatever agreement is reached, there'll be restriction to trade and restriction to migration. And therefore the potential growth rate of the United Kingdom is gonna be lower. What do you think, how will the Brexit um, weigh on the European economy? Well, initially there has not been an impact of Brexit on the European economy. There's been actually a pickup of economic growth in Europe and the Eurozone, in part because uh, there's been reform, in part because there is less fiscal austerity, in part because the European Central Bank has been very aggressive in easing monetary policy in very unconventional way. And there is also an improvement in the balance sheets, less deleveraging and so on. So actually the Eurozone economy last year did fine. And even this year, there has been a, a pickup of economic growth. And the financial links and the trade links between uh, United Kingdom and Europe are important. But since there has not been a slowdown of the UK economy, there has not been also a slowdown of the European economy. Now, if uh, the Brexit negotiations were becoming particularly tense, you might have an impact on business and consumer confidence. And if, of course, uh, the divorce was going to be a painful a divorce that is ugly, and if that leads to signals that other economies in the Eurozone and Europe might decide to also, over time, leave the European Union, the impacts could be more significant. And there is also the political dimension that Brexit might actually lead to a breakup of the United Kingdom, uh, maybe Scottish independence, maybe a referendum in Northern Ireland that might lead them to unify with Ireland. The impact of those things are going to be important because if Scotland or Northern Ireland move on, then maybe the Catalans in Spain are going to say, me too, me too, and they want independence from Spain, for example. And then you're going to start to see concerns about further disintegration of the Eurozone. As you mentioned, the already warned about a, a breakup of the European Union already last year, and now we are into uh, 
they are nine months since the referendum and nothing has happened. We haven't seen any chain reaction. Do you s still think there might be a, 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 is a high risk of breakup or isn't the European Union gain, gaining some ground and, and or strength? Well, uh, there are different scenarios about the future of uh, European Union and the Eurozone. I would say one extreme scenario will be one in which this year and next uh, a bunch of uh, populist parties of extreme right or extreme left come in power, say, you know, suppose that Le Pen were to win in France or this Cinque Stelle party in Italy comes to power, this could be the beginning of the end of Europe. I would say that scenario in the short run doesn't look very likely, say Le Pen, even if in Italy this anti-Euro party may come to power. Uh, the second scenario is one in which uh, moderates and the right and the left parties stay in power and therefore those uh, disintegration forces uh, uh, remain contained and maybe you have more integration over time. But I think that there is a third scenario that maybe is the most likely one, is one in which the populists maybe don't come to power today, but they become uh, politically influential and they can constrain what mainstream party can do in terms of greater European integration. So for example, suppose that in France, Le Pen, uh, gets 40% uh, of the vote in the second round. She's a huge force then. And then the extreme left of the Socialist Party and Communists are also going to be in the street saying, we want less reform, less integration. That can constrain what, say, Macron could do. We might not even have a parliamentary majority. So the point is, populist parties of right and left may remain popular throughout Europe, core and periphery, even if they're not in power, there is not a lot of political capital that the mainstream party can invest into more integration. So you don't get a collapse of Europe and the Eurozone. But over the next few years, with economic malaise, with high unemployment, low economic growth, these uh, populist parties gradually influence economic choices in a way that becomes maybe a slow motion disintegration, but still a slow motion disintegration. That's a risk that I don't think you um, should underestimate. Well, staying with um, the euro, you've mentioned that the eurozone economy is doing a, a bit better these days. Yeah. And you've also mentioned that perhaps that uh, markets are overestimating the immediate threat uh, from populists. So do you think that markets are, are too pessimistic uh, about the eurozone at the moment? I wouldn't say they're too pessimistic. Of course, there were a number of episodes in the last few years when there was a a risk of a uh, breakup of the Eurozone, Greeks exiting, and there were risk of episodes in which uh, the currency moved, the stock market moves, sovereign spread moves uh, excessively. Right now, I would say actually, uh, sovereign spreads have widened because they were worried about Italy and France, but not too much, as long as ECB is doing QE, interest rates are gonna remain relatively low. There's been actually a pickup in European stocks. Uh, they Euro has been weakening gradually because of the differential between US and European monetary policy, but only gradually. And I would say if the Eurozone economy improves, probably there is even some upside for European stocks that have been picking up in the last few weeks. Regarding the, the, the European economy's um, uh, weakness, uh, it's still stagnating. Do you think the uh, European central banks um, lose monetary policy um, is effective to, to, to boost growth? Well, what uh, the European Central Bank has done with unconventional monetary policy has been avoiding double dip or triple dip recessions and the deflation that was a significant risk uh, a couple of years ago before the ECB went into quantitative easing and negative policy rates. Some of that pickup of economic growth and pickup of inflation and avoiding deflation has been tank to what the ECB has done, in addition to having less fiscal austerity, less fiscal drag. But it's of course obvious that monetary policy cannot affect long-term economic growth. Long-term economic growth comes from reforms that increase productivity growth and the long-term potential of an economy. However, what monetary and fiscal policy can do is to buy you time so that you have enough time to have a pickup of economic activity to do the kind of economic reform that needed to increase potential growth. Now, some people, and that's the German view, worry that this easy monetary policy 
causes unquote moral hazard that says uh, you have so much time to do reforms that you don't do those reforms and those reforms stall. So there is that argument against unconventional monetary policy. I don't buy that argument because if there is not economic growth, if there is no job creation, if there is no real income growth, politically, for governments who have to make tough reforms, austerity, sacrifices, if there is no light at the end of the tunnel, it becomes harder to do those reforms. And European countries, the southern countries, already did a lot of austerity. Do you think it is enough today, now, after like five or six years of austerity, or is there more austerity needed? Well, the answer depends on, on the country. Uh, Italy is already below 3% uh, yes. deficit and have the primary surplus, but the debt ratio is high, and therefore, gradually over time, they have to reduce that debt ratio. Countries like uh, in the periphery, like Spain and Portugal, are still above 3%. Even France, as a member of core, is above 4%. I think the debate on austerity is tricky because, on one side, of course, you have to reduce deficits in order to make debt sustainable. Otherwise, eventually, there is a risk of a debt crisis. On the other side, whether you like it or not, in the short run, raising taxes and cutting government spending as a fiscal drug in terms of reducing aggregate demand and therefore slows down economic growth and then leads to a buildup of those debt ratios. So I don't think there is a disagreement on the need for gradual fiscal austerity. The question is how much you want to front load it, how much you want to back load it, whether if you do more structural reform, increased potential growth, you should be given slack on achieving your fiscal targets or not. And of course, there are arguments one way or another. Let's turn to the US uh, and the potential impact of Trump on the global economy. Uh, Republicans in the US Congress are pushing uh, a corporate tax reform that would involve a highly uh, controversial uh, border adjustment tax. In your most recent column for uh, Project Syndicate, you're extremely critical about the proposal. Uh, talk us through why it's such a bad idea. Well, this border adjustment tax is a bad idea <coughs> for several reasons. Previous on number one, it might be a WTO illegal. And if you pass it, then you ignore the WTO. There's a risk of retaliation and trade wars. The second reason is uh, is protectionist, and you're giving a signal that you're going to become even more protectionist than you are right now. Third of all, uh, some firms that are exporting are going to do very well. Those that are in the import sectors are going to be hurt. Massive increase in their tax liabilities. Some of them might become insolvent, go out of business. So there are massive redistributional effects within the corporate sector that are not fair. Additionally, it's a pretty regressive uh, tax. You're doing a corporate tax uh, cut that goes to the rich and the corporates, while uh, an increase in import tariffs is going to imply that the bottom 10% of the population, those who buy cheap goods from China and emerging markets, are going to have an increase in their tax burden. So it's a very regressive tax. Additionally, the value of the dollar may react to this uh, restriction by strengthening and undoing the protectionist effect. So it's going to be a bit of a wash, or if it doesn't increase as much, then some of the cost is going to imply a rise in import prices and inflation. Again, it's going to hurt the economy. And there's also a fundamental important factor. Even if the dollar were to strengthen by the full amount of the tariff, so there is no impact on trade, you have a loss because anybody who has dollar debt, like many emerging markets, will have a real increase in their dollar liabilities and you could even have financial crisis and distress. While any American who has foreign assets with dollar appreciation will have a loss on the value in dollar of those foreign assets and those losses could be of the order of three, four trillion dollars. So you'll have a capital levy also on the US. So for all these reasons, I think this is not a desirable policy. And my views, regardless of whether you like it or not, it's highly unlikely that the US Congress is going to pass a border adjustment tax because there will be enough senators and congresspeople 
even within the Republican Party who are against it. So most likely this bad idea is not going to become a policy. Let's hope you're right. At least uh, um, President Trump is, is, is likely to pursue protectionist um, yeah. um, policy, um, trade policy. So what would be the consequences for Europe and maybe also for Germany? Um, just uh, to, for example, what would happen to TTIP, but in, in a general um, view, what would be the consequences? Yeah, I mean, certainly the concern that the US is going to become more protectionist is an important one. Um, the good news is, however, that until now, the threat of more extreme policy actions like branding a whole bunch of countries as currency manipulators or having across the board tariffs against China, Europe, or Mexico, or a border adjustment tax, those things that would rattle the markets and will have a negative impact on growth, so far they have not been implemented. In the case of uh, Europe and the Eurozone, I would say the Germans are saying, uh, listen, it's not our fault because uh, trade imbalance is derived from differences in saving versus investment. Uh, we don't do trade policy at the EU level. It's done at the EU level, so it's not our fault. And monetary policy affects the currencies done by the European Central Bank, not by us. And we're also critical of some of the actions of the European Central Banks. I don't think that the Americans are going to buy this argument. They're going to try to put some pressure on Europe and Germany. And by the way, the European current account surplus relative to the rest of the world is rising. So there'll be trade friction between US and Europe, maybe less so than between the US and uh, Mexico or China. Uh, since the Trump administration has said we're going to cancel TPP, the progress on TTIP is going to be limited. They've not formally dropped it, but it doesn't look like there's going to be significant progress. So I would say the trade tension between US and Europe should be less than between US and other regions of the world, but there'll be meaningful amounts of trade frictions as well. Thank you so much, uh, Nouriel, for those uh, really insightful uh, answers. I think we've all learned uh, a lot. Uh, and thank you all uh, for watching uh, PS On Air with Nouriel Rubini, uh, the founder of uh, Rubini Macro Associates, and join us again soon.